Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. I'm your host, Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Matt Myers to the show. Matt Myers is the head of EarthX Capital. Matt is a climate trim tab and serial impact platform creator with a wealth of experience designing and driving strategic change within organizations and ecosystems to achieve large-scale positive impacts on society and the environment. Matt is also the founder and director of the eCapital Summit, a platform convening private capital, cutting-edge environmental technology companies, ecosystem partners, and government to form partnerships having substantial positive impacts on people and the planet. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Raj. How are you? Matt, I'm doing very well. Matt, where in the world are you today? I am in San Francisco, California today. It is sunny and 70 degrees. And that's why I asked. Feel free to tease me with the weather. (laughs) And where are you today, Raj? I am in Addison, Texas, small city just north of Dallas. Great. So, Matt, I'd like to open the show off by asking my guest the following question. If you were asked to share something interesting about yourself, what would it be? I can speak Chinese fluently. It's a interesting thing about myself that not many people know. I lived in China for about six and a half years. And that's actually what got me motivated to, uh, to work on climate and what I do now. Now, what were you doing in China? That's a really long story. <laughs> but I was a student at Cal State Northridge at the time and also working in music. And I read the book, The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman and decided that the future was either in China, India, or Brazil. And I had traveled to China when I was six years old, traveled a lot when I was growing up. My my mother uh, and my grandmother would take me on, a, on trips every year to what were then called developing countries. And China was the first one. And I, I had really fond memories of it. And so I chose China. I I went to my professor's office hours at the time. I was in an international finance course. I noticed that she was from China. I told her this idea and I said, I noticed that you could teach English in China. That could be a way to go. Should I do that or do you know anybody? And she looked at me and she said, Matt, you're stupid. I'm like, why is that? She said, well, you're about to get a degree from here and I'm on the board of the China Scholarship Council. And so... I did a few things, got the scholarship, sold everything that I owned, um, and was living in a dormitory that was about four by eight feet and sleeping on a piece of plywood in a a dormitory at uh, Shanghai University of Finance and Economics, studying Chinese in the day. And I also nightlighted as a futures and forex broker as well. And I stayed and got a graduate degree there from Tsinghua University. I got an MPA in international development with a focus on climate change. And um, that's what that's what really got me activated. Um, and after, after my degree, I, I worked for a startup there for about two and a half years prior to moving back to the U.S. That really is interesting. And at one time, I think it was right around the early 2000s when Friedman's work was quite popular and The World is Flat, one of his books, was one of my favorite books at the time. And not to move on to too much of a geopolitical stance, but I kind of feel like, you know, he had said the world is flat, and I think certain aspect of that is still true. But I feel like with some of the more nationalistic movements we're seeing around the world, we're realizing just how flat it wasn't. You know, some of these movements that were once looked like to be global are now snapping back, if you will. Uh, That's a really good point, or maybe it got too flat. (laughs) <laughs> right. I, 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 I totally agree. You know, this, this idea of open borders and easy migration, immigration, I think that's what's fueling some of this pushback now. So one of my favorite books, I actually even enjoyed his um, The Lexus and the Olive Tree and his uh, the, the McDonald's. Um, I think, wasn't that his uh, hypothesis, the McDonald's one where no two countries that had a McDonald's in them ever went to war? I don't know. I don't remember. Okay. Well, switching gears a little bit here, can you share a little bit about your current endeavor and why it's important to you? 
Absolutely. So I work for EarthX, where uh, environmental C3 that uh, puts on the largest environmental experience in the world and do that in Dallas. Um, April, it'll be this year, it'll be April 22nd through 26th. And uh, for them, I founded and run an investment summit called eCapital Summit. This will be the fourth year of eCapital. Uh, in addition to uh, doing one at EarthX, also done one um, in partnership with Carnegie Mellon University during their Energy Week and also with Greentown Labs in Boston uh, for the opening of their global center, which made them the largest clean tech accelerator um, in the country, at least with hardware. I don't know if that includes software as well. So uh, this will be the fourth year. Last year we had roughly 250 people that were evenly distributed between entrepreneurs, investors, and ecosystem partners. And the entrepreneurs anywhere from C to Z. So a startup from, let's say, UT Austin to a Proterra. And we had roughly 70 companies in the room. And on the investor side, we had about 60 entities representing over $600 billion of assets under management. And it was anywhere from an angel to a financier. And in terms of ecosystem partners, those are incubators, accelerators, national labs, and government. And government, more specifically, the Department of Energy um, and RBE. And uh, through the course of my work, I have been unofficially advising the Department of Energy's first chief commercialization officer for about two years now. So that's 250 people at the eCapital event. Can you share with the audience from the broader EarthX how many people visited last year? Sure. Uh, for EarthX as a whole, we had over 175,000 people. And a lot of those people are going to the EarthX Expo that we have at Dallas Fair Park, which is the 24th through the 26th this year of April. Um, and we had over 600 exhibitors. That's pretty amazing. And how many people are you expecting this year? Do you know? I have no idea. <laughs> it's always, uh, with our organization, it's always bigger and better. So, so I, I've heard, I would expect that number to go up. But I, I I've no heard idea. rumors of north of 200,000. I, I have no clue, but I, I hope so. That would be great. So let's drill into the eCapital Summit a little bit. You know, if someone attends, what can they expect to experience and perhaps walk away with? Sure. So um, it's a convening and we have amazing content. Um, so keynotes and panelists. Uh, we also have plenty of time for networking that takes place. Um, and we also have a Investor Connect session which is where we match up participating companies with investors based off of technology vertical and stage for one-on-one -on -one 15 minute meetings. Uh, we also have a 10 K climate tech startup prize competition, and we have a couple workshops that we're doing as well. So at the end of the day, it's just bringing the best entrepreneurs and the best investors, and the best entities that help create more great companies together. And no service providers are allowed in the room. So it's, it's, uh, it's really an accelerator itself, if you will. And what does the E in E capital stand for? E could be environment, electricity. Um, there's lots of fun words that are related to... Uh, so what we do with the letter E. Sounds like entrepreneurship is in there too. Yeah, it is. It is. There's lots of great words um, you, could, you can come up with that start with the letter E. So offline, we were talking briefly also about your task force that you're working with. Can you share with the audience a little bit about that? Absolutely. So that is a result of that work with um, the chief commercialization officer at the Department of Energy. And he sits inside of um, 
TTO or the technology transitions office and also uh, the work that I was doing advising uh, the acting director of Arbor E um, in her special advisor. And so I was walking into them at first, educating them about the early stage funding gaps that, uh, that climate tech companies are facing. And uh, that was very useful to them. There was a lot of uh, lessons to be learned and a lot of great work that's been done to address those funding gaps. And then I started to explore growth and later stage funding gaps and did the same thing, going in there and, and telling them that and talking to them about that. And they said, Matt, I just don't see uh, where the federal government sits in this because Typically, the federal government has focused on R&D and uh, early stage entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurship, right? So supporting early, very early stage companies in R&D, and then the government gets out of the way, and, uh, and then the private sector comes in. And if the private sector doesn't fund the company, then it shouldn't be commercialized. It's not, it's not meant for the market, and the market should rule. Um, but after speaking with investors and entrepreneurs, I found that to be not exactly the case and that there were market friendly ways that the federal government could support these companies, especially companies that received, um, U S federal funding in the past. And, uh, the reason why this is important is because other countries, especially company countries that can be considered. U.S. economic adversaries are putting a lot of money into these industries and also coming into the U.S. and buying up our companies and, or worse yet, stealing the IP. And those industries and those shops will, uh, will be grown in their countries, not in ours. So it's, it becomes a an issue of national security. And uh, after working on this with them, uh, we held uh, Chatham House Rule whiteboarding sessions as part of eCapital Summit last April. And uh, from that produced a paper. That paper was passed around the Department of Energy and around other federal agencies and got to the White House and was well received there. And as a result of that, uh, I was invited to the White House and went and then held a meeting in DC in September with some center of right think tanks, uh, one of which you had on your podcast uh, recently, uh, Krez, but there were some others in the room as well. And, uh, they loved the paper, found it to be useful. They said, but we need to put steel on the ground. And uh, by putting steel on the ground, they suggested uh, launching a task force, which is uh, what we did. And we had the first meeting um, a week ago um, with those groups and also um, made some amazing entrepreneurs and investors. And we looked at uh, manufacturing incentives that could be utilized to, uh, to keep these companies in the United States because one of the major, um, one of the major points for losing the IP is when, uh, these startups can't manufacture in the U S because their orders are deemed as too small and they can't get competitive price points. So they offshore it. And so we were, we were brainstorming around what the federal government could do to address that issue. Now, if someone in the audience is interested in learning more about the task force or keeping up with what you're doing, do you have a link you can share with me later or somewhere where they can go to, to perhaps read up further on it? Sure. I would suggest going to the, eCapital landing page on the EarthX website, earthx.org, and uh, they can reach out to, to the eCapital team there. And uh, we're happy to provide them with um, 
authentic information they need. Well, I absolutely put a link to that. So Matt, one of the things I really like to focus on in the show is the why behind what you're doing. So obviously, you know, you mentioned your your brief history or, you know, even brief, your time in China and how that perhaps influenced, you know, what you're doing. But why, you know, you could be doing so many other things. You mentioned your startup experience. So there's an opportunity cost for you to be here leading this particular charge on this endeavor. So what drives you? What's your why? Oh, my why? <laughs> Sometimes I don't know. I think I'm a little crazy. Um, <laughs> but I I wake up every morning wanting to make a positive impact on, on humanity. And uh, that primary issue is climate. Um, and that's what drives me every day. Um, I wouldn't be working for an environmental nonprofit if that wasn't the case. And uh, again, it was that experience living in China, um, drinking the water, eating the food, breathing that air. When I lived there, they had what was called air to get it, which is where the PM 2.5 levels were so bad, you could barely see outside of your window. And the combination of physically experiencing that with uh, studying under uh, some of the top minds in China around the subject matter and seeing that if we don't change business as usual in a radical way, then we're done for. And the best ways to do that are to in my viewpoint, are to um, to harness the, the the capitalist economy that we've built and which is working for us, rather than destroy it. Why don't we um, Why don't we embrace it and direct it in a way that will pr- produce the end results we all want, which is a uh, a sustainable, healthy environment um, of abundance for everybody. And it's possible. So um, it was a combination of those two, uh, the physical experience that I had in China combined, combined with that mental breakthrough. And um, I saw um, what I wanted to do was to help direct capital towards solutions that are going to um, not only solve this problem, but um, create jobs and economic growth at the same time. You know, I really like that idea of driving capital towards these solutions. What's some of the pushback or perhaps feedback or challenges you've experienced when trying to explain some of these ideas, whether it was to the government or just in general? Mm. Well, there, there's different there are different obstacles to, co- to overcome. Uh, from the investor standpoint, at the end of the day, they care about IRR. What's my return, my comparable return to my other investments? And if they're going to take a haircut, they lose a lot of interest. Even if they have a passion for the environment and want to do something about it, their response will be, well, that's my philanthropic money. That's not my investment money, which is a much smaller bucket. And that's been, I would say, the biggest pushback um, that I have received over the years. Uh, But that dynamic is changing, I believe, which is great. And once that changes, once the IRR becomes com- equal to or greater than IRRs of their other investments, that's game over. You'll see a, a lot more money come online uh, from the from the traditionals and uh, pushback from the government is is I, I want to call it pushback. It's it's just. Um, the, the dynamic of Washington is, 
is interesting. And um, I engage with Republicans on a regular basis. And it's that matter of where could and should the government sit in this equation. And uh, the Republican way has been let the market decide. Um, So that has been the greatest challenge is to, or I'd say opportunity is to find that happy medium where, where the government can support entrepreneurship in the space that isn't seen as intervening um, with the markets. And as with the investors, when those, those IRRs tick up, that'll be the market deciding. Um, Absolutely. So, so it, so that, 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 that'll solve the, or, you know, help move the, the, the policy um, problem as well. Now, this might be a little premature question, but, you know, Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, came out in January with his letter and speaking about investments in climate change and the challenges around climate change. Have you seen any additional investor interest in the e-capital event since that announcement? Um, in the e-capital event itself, maybe. It's an, it's an established brand. So uh, we have an amazing lineup and I'm very honored by the support of the ecosystem over the past years. Um, I'd say, yeah, I guess so. I mean, we've got, we've got fantastic investors. We're, we're trying to put together a panel of, of new investors. What's most exciting is um, the amount of uh, money that's come online announcements that have been made the last three to six months. Um, that's a, that's a very, um, very encouraging development. And I think that in general is, is creating excitement around the space um, from investors who uh, are traditionally just seeking that IRR, uh, regardless of impact. Staying along the lines of e-capital and investors, you've been involved for a few years now. Do you have any quick, good stories you can share that have come out of some of the events? Sure. Um, actually, one of my, uh, well, I don't have favorites, but uh, an entrepreneur an entrepreneur who I really like actually gave me a call this morning who's been really supportive of eCapital over the past couple of years. His name's Chris Ripley of Smarter Sorting. Uh, he's actually from Texas, based in Austin. Uh, when he participated in eCapital for the first time, he came with a banner. Um, it, he found the convening to be so helpful for him and his business. He came, he raised quite a bit of funding. I won't go into numbers, but quite a bit of funding and, um, and had a, a really large exhibit at EarthX the next year. And, um, the next year had him back to moderate a panel and he's coming back again and he's recruiting investors and, um, and uh, I, I think it, he just actually closed his B round as well, uh, and a nice size B round. So um, that's been a that's been a great success story. And uh, there are lots of other stories out there that I hear about. I wish folks would be more assertive and share them with me rather than being on a phone call and them just mentioning it. <laughs> oh, by the way, um, a year ago this happened due to somebody I met at the at the E Capital Summit. Thank you. And my response is always, well, I wish you would have told me that earlier. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been a really uh, amazing journey. And again, just um, really humbled by uh, the support of, of the ecosystem for what we do uh, from both the investor side and uh, the entrepreneurship side and the ecosystem partner side of things. Um, uh, after the, the, the 2016 election and a lot of, um, uh, federal attacks on the environment, people really banded together and, um, it's that solidarity, which has 
resulted in a thriving uh, uh, ecosystem that as this new money comes online that everybody's talking about, like Jeff Bezos's $10 billion earth fund and stuff like that, as that comes online, because this ecosystem had to, has had to go through a lot of tough times since 2008, um, I believe it's, it's ripe and ready to, to embrace this new interest and new capital um, and scale all the work that, that we're doing. Well, I can tell you that our CEO, Ben Hubbard, and myself were there last year, and we were really excited by the event, and you know, we're coming back again this year, so we can absolutely vouch for it. Some of the people in the room were fantastic to speak to, and the opportunity is there, too, so I really appreciate you putting on that event. Well, we appreciate you all coming and for spreading the word as well, um, such as including us on this podcast. <laughs> absolutely. So, Matt, I'd like to round the conversation off with this question. If you could share some advice or words of wisdom with the audience, what would it be? Vote. <laughs> I, I'd like to. I'd like to elaborate on that just a little bit. Please, absolutely. Uh, uh, so the task force work that I've been doing, and the policy in general work that I've been diving into over the past uh, year and a half to two years. What's really interesting is the number of really amazing minds in the uh, clean tech or climate tech innovation ecosystem who are uh, getting into the policy game this year. Uh, I've spoken with a few folks, which I admire, and they're going to be uh, doing some work beginning in the summer that I'm really excited about. And it's this realization that um, we need to focus on policy now. Usually there's been this, um, this feeling in, in California and Silicon Valley, if you want to call it that, uh, that never mind policy, never mind government. Oh, uh, it's a, it's just a, it's just a oak tree, right? It's, it grows slowly. And uh, we need entrepreneurship to change the dynamic. But now I see these amazing minds in the entrepreneurship ecosystem who are going to work on policy this year. So um, it's happening. And um, I'm very optimistic. And so, again, if I could give advice to anybody is vote and vote for um candidates who um who rate the environment as a top issue well, i really appreciate that matt vote great advice i look forward to seeing you at the event and catching up with you there well thank you so much for having me thank you matt thank you for listening and if you like what you heard please download the podcast and subscribe bigger than us is a nexus pmg production and you can find and follow us on all the social channels under the handle Nexus PMG.